and welcome to our Friday webinar. We are back on with Dr. Stephanie Lamb and uh, Dr. Lamb, I believe today. Hey, welcome. Uh, Hello. We are covering respiratory diseases and pet birds. Yes. Yep, we're covering respiratory problems. Okay, okay. Um, let me make, I imagine you, you always have these wonderful um, PowerPoints for us, so I'm assuming, but. Uh, yep, I have another one for today. <laughs> Yay, and I see a Royals. Oh, he's really close. He's just checking us out today. He's like, uh, hey, so why we wait for people to log in? I was curious. Um, well, I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. I did. Thank you. I hope you did too. I did. I was wondering, did, I mean, do you ever see any um, fallout like vet wise from a, a Thanksgiving dinner celebration gone wrong with pet birds? Like <laughs> any, any like well, day after or day of or any yeah any you know so so i would say most veterinarians who treat more typical species like dogs and cats absolutely the next day after thanksgiving there's some fallout because usually the pets were getting some treats a little bit more than what they were used to and then vomiting and diarrhea is extremely common in veterinary hospitals the, the day after thanksgiving uh, i mean when with the birds I would say, thankfully, they're not getting as many treats um, as as the dogs and the cats, so we don't have a lot of that as a as a problem. Um, unfortunately, like we had talked about the last time when we were going over the holiday hazards, the, the big thing that we will get either on thanks it's usually on Thanksgiving Day because we do see emergencies. We're not open, but we have emergency doctors on call. Um, is Teflon toxicity, sadly, because people uh, sometimes forget um, that Teflon is a problem or people using the self-cleaning function on the oven like the day after, a few days after. Um, yeah. yeah, so that would be our big thing with the birds. Oh, wow, that's a great point about the self-cleaning ovens because, I mean, people always, you know, like they get their kitchen prepped for the big holiday and then clean up afterwards, right? And that's, that's yeah. one thing that's definitely looked like. All yeah. right. Wow. Yeah. Something to, I guess, be aware of, right? Yep. Um, that and uh, just, I'm sure there's some, some birds that had some like uh, parsnips or that was just yummy and maybe they went overboard on that or something. <laughs> okay. well, yeah. But you know, they, they, they seem to handle it better when they do go overboard on eating stuff that, you know, maybe they don't have normally. They seem to handle it a little easier than the mammals do. <laughs> It's that parent intelligence that we always talk about, right? It's underestimated. Yes. Maybe that's it. Yeah. <laughs> that's so far. They're like, well, I know my limits here. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, I guess um, I'm just going to remind everybody that we're, you know, per usual, if you have a question for Dr. Lamb, we'll try to get to it at the end of the webinar and use the Q&A button. Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. Real quick. Uh, just to Brenda point out that some oven bags uh, have nonstick coating. So that's something to be aware of. So Yes. Yep. That is true. Some are, some are fine, some don't have any problems, and, and some are not so fine. So, so you got to read the fine print, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. So let's, uh, yeah, I'm going to let you take it away. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and we'll get our PowerPoint up here. There we go. Okay. All right. So again, we're going to be talking about respiratory problems today. And actually, it was uh, it's kind of funny because today... Um, at the office here, the couple of patients I've had in the morning time, uh, two of them were actually presenting for some respiratory related things. So it seemed, uh, I guess, interesting that that's what our topic is, is today. But it is a common problem that we are dealing with uh, in birds. So I'm sure it was just more of the fact that it's one of the common things that comes into the office because your respiratory system, um, as I'm going to show in a moment, is, you know, quite uh, expanded throughout the bird. So there's different ways the respiratory system can be affected. So we're going to we're going to get into that. Okay, so as usual, when I'm doing these avian vet insider talks, I like to show you guys a little bit of anatomy because anatomy is so important. As I've said many times before, you have to understand anatomy and physiology in order to understand how things are working and thus how things can go wrong and then what you need to do to make it better. Um, so looking at this bird that has been our anatomy subject for several of the lectures that I have been giving. Um, we've 
we've already pointed out many things on our bird. We've talked about um, the liver, which is these little structures down here. We've talked about the heart and the vascular system. But today, since we're talking about the respiratory system, this picture actually makes it a little bit difficult to see the respiratory system because the lungs are actually right back here. This little sliver that you can see on either side. And it's just because this particular anatomical picture just doesn't really highlight them so well, but I wanted to show it because this is the same bird I've been showing the whole time. Um, so the lungs are actually tucked up along the back of the bird, uh, kind of behind other structures. So all these other structures are sort of up in front and they have air sacs that are branching off of those lungs. So birds are unique in that they don't just have their lungs, they have those air sacs coming off of them that expand into different parts of their body. And as mammals, we just think about lungs, you know, we think, okay, respiratory system, we have our like upper airways and our sinuses, our trachea and our lungs, and we don't think about much beyond that. But birds, they have all that stuff plus air sacs that branch out. And this picture here shows a little bit better what the respiratory system is like. So as I mentioned, the lungs are plastered sort of up along the back. And that's what this grayer structure is, is the lung tissue. The lungs are paired. There's a right and left lung. Um, and they're different from mammal lungs because they're kind of, mammal lungs are a little, they're able to like sort of expand and contract. Whereas bird lungs are just kind of fixed in place. Um, and they actually have, they kind of up a butt, a butt against the back and the ribs actually kind of um, like come around them. So like they actually have little divots in the lungs where the ribs sort of like fit into, which is very interesting. But aside from their lungs, just to kind of go through the full anatomy, here's the opening um, into the, when they you know open up their mouth and they're inhaling, we have air that travels down the trachea and goes into the lungs here. You'll see these branches of sinuses, sinuses that come up into, um, up above in the head. And this picture does not even do justice to the level of sinuses that birds have, because birds have so extensive sinuses. I mean, it's really quite amazing. Um, and it is variable from species to species or such they like large species to groups because um, parrots generally are pretty well conserved, but they're different from passerines, which are going to be different from um, our galliforms, which are like the chickens and turkeys and those sort of guys. Uh, they're not extremely different, but there are some subtle differences between them. So sinuses, this picture does not do it justice. They are very, very, very extensive. But as we follow an air molecule that gets inhaled in, it travels down the trachea and goes into the lungs. But interestingly, it actually does not, there's no gas exchange initially as that single little molecule of oxygen passes into the lungs. It actually passes into the lungs and through the lungs and goes into the abdominal air sac. So when a bird inhales, that oxygen bypasses the lungs initially and goes into the posterior thoracic air sacs and abdominal air sacs. So it gets inhaled into air sacs first and specifically the air sacs in the back part of the body. Then when a bird exhales, it pushes that air back into the lungs and that's when gas exchange actually happens. So it's not on the inhale that they're having gas exchange, it's on the exhale that they're having gas exchange in the lungs, which is unique and interesting. Um, but then as there's that gas exchange, you have oxygen that gets absorbed into the vascular space in those lungs, but then you have carbon dioxide that's offloaded um, from the, the vascular space into the lungs to be exhaled. So now that carbon dioxide um, is out in the lungs. And as they inhale the next time, that carbon dioxide actually goes into the anterior thoracic air sacs and the interclavicular air sacs. And there's little branches. This is actually the interclavicular air sac communicates with the humerus. So the bones actually have air sacs that branch into them. And so air actually goes into the, the humerus and depending upon some species, it can even branch down into the ulna too, which is really pretty amazing. Um, there's some branches into the femur and different species too. Uh, the birds that have branches of their air sacs that go all the way to the ulna is the California condors and a few other birds. Um, so the parrots don't have that, but it's really quite interesting how much like air travels throughout their body. So again, that carbon dioxide, it, when they inhale and then goes into the anterior thoracic air sacs and the 
um, interclavicular air sacs and up into the humerus. And then when they exhale, it goes back out through those and then back out the trachea. So like a full respiratory cycle in birds of where we think we inhale, oxygen that goes into the lungs, gas exchange occurs, and we exhale and that carbon dioxide is released. It actually takes two full cycles of inhalation, exhalation, inhalation, exhalation in a bird for that full kind of complete respiratory cycle to sort of occur. So um, if we're thinking of it in like sort of a unilateral term, so it's really quite interesting um, and important to know about because, you know, in mammals, we just have to kind of think about the lungs again and the trachea, but those air sacs are really important to birds and there's problems that can happen with those air sacs that then affects that respiratory system. And we're going to get into that a bit. Um, to show you just a little bit more of anatomy stuff though, before we get into the specific problems that can happen with the respiratory system, um, I wanted to show you these x-rays. And the reason I want to show you x-rays is because I like to show you guys x-rays because these are things that we are looking at as veterinarians. And, um, it, it's something, a diagnostic tool that we use to help us to evaluate the respiratory system of a bird. And so this first x-ray that's over here, you can actually see the trachea. And these are both parrots. Uh, this one is an Amazon on the left. And the one on the right, I believe is a conure, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, but this is the trachea. So again, that air gets uh, inhaled, moves down the trachea, moves down into the lungs. Up here, again, plastered against the back of the bird, this is the lung tissue. And you can kind of see this, what's called reticular pattern. Um, it's this sort of like cross-linked kind of like mesh-like appearance. That's uh, the lung of a bird. That's normal. Um, and then all back here, that helps to create contrast around the organs is where we have our air sacs. Um, air sac, the like membranes are extremely thin and you normally don't see them so well on an x-ray um, because they're kind of shaped around the different organs. And actually having that air around those organs allows us to have better definition around the organis, organs. So it's kind of nice because um, you're able to see organs a little bit better because of that contrast between gas and other soft tissue opacities. Now, if we look at uh, this image, we can see things slightly differently. And here is the trachea coming down. It's kind of superimposed with the vertebrae of the neck. So we have to just be mindful of the fact that we're seeing sort of two things on top of each other. This is not the best image for looking at the trachea. And this is why we take two x-rays or a good example of why we take two x-rays because I can see the trachea much better here and follow it along its length. But here it's a little harder because it's superimposed with the bones of the neck. So. Um, but what I can see better on this image, I can see these air sacs much better. So as that trachea uh, oxygen molecule moves down the trachea and into the lungs, the lungs are plastered back up against the back. And I don't see the lungs as well on this image as I do on this image. This image, I can really see that reticular pattern to the lungs. But this image over here, I can't see it as well because it's being superimposed with pectoral muscle mass, the ribs. Um, versus down here, the pectoral muscle mass is sort of out of the way and it's on the keel bone. So, but up here, that pectoral muscle mass is kind of like on top of the chest. So I can't see the lungs as well. I, they're there. Uh, they're just, they're not, this is not the best view for me to evaluate the lungs, but it's a very good view for me to evaluate the air sacs. And you see all this black, everything that's black on an x-ray is gas. And you see all the gas around the bird because that's just the oxygen and, you know, gases in the room, uh, room air. Um, but the gases inside the bird that are in the air sacs are all around here. So this is, gives you a really good idea of normal, healthy looking air sacs in a bird. Okay. So that's the anatomy stuff. So what sort of problems could we possibly have? And Arroyo is getting himself into trouble because I think one of the things Arroyo loves to do while I'm doing webinars is when he loves to get in trouble most. I have to move because he uh, was chewing somebody's uh, stethoscope and stethoscopes are a little bit expensive. So it's not something we want him to destroy for somebody else, that'd be mean. <laughs> Um, so anyways, there's various problems that can happen uh, that can affect the, the respiratory system. And what we're going to go over today is we're going to go over uh, several infectious diseases, but also inflammatory conditions that can happen with the respiratory system. And then how there can be problems with other parts of the body that secondarily affect the respiratory system. Um, so let's go ahead and get right into that. So um, first thing we're going to go over is infectious diseases. Now, when we're talking about infectious diseases, there are four big groups, bacteria, fungi, parasites and viruses. 
Um, we're going to start off with bacteria because bacterial infections are one of the more common problems that we will see. And there's a variety of different types of bacteria that are out there that can cause problems. But one of the big ones that people know about in birds and that we're often searching for as veterinarians is chlamydia. So I think a lot of bird owners have heard about chlamydia. Their bird's been tested for chlamydia at some point. It's a good disease to check them for to make sure that they don't have, um, or if they do, we need to know it and we need to be, you know, appropriately treating them for it. Um, but chlamydia is classically this respiratory infection uh, that can cause some pretty significant changes to the respiratory tract. It can damage the respiratory tract and cause them to, to progress into pneumonia. I mean, it can lead to other organs being dysfunctioned, uh, like, like liver problems. Um, it can cause quite a bit of problems. But the other problem with, with chlamydia is it can be very subtle. And in fact, birds can carry it and not always show signs of it. So it's something that's sort of frustrating because you know, you would think, ah, if you have this particular infection, you're gonna show signs from it. Not the case always. Birds can carry it and be totally fine and act great, but they can shed it and they can spread it to others. And something that's important to know is that chlamydia is a zoonotic disease. And that means it is infectious to people. Um, so people can pick up chlamydia from birds and that's uh, in them, it's gonna cause cold-like symptoms. Um, so, you know, when we, when we're worried about bacterial infections, chlamydia is just one of them. There's tons of others though. I mean, you can get like E. coli or Klebsiella or mycobacteria or uh, mycoplasma. I mean, there's lots of different bacterial organisms that are out there. And some of them like the E. coli's and the Klebsiella's, those guys um, are kind of bacteria that you just find in the environment very, very easily. I mean, they're, I'm sure in this room, uh, where I am sitting, there has got to be E. coli, if not on my skin, on surfaces and, and a variety of places, um, amongst many other types of bacteria too. Um, but sometimes they just get into the wrong spot and they become opportunistic infectious organisms and lead to problems. Um, and the problems that we can see for respiratory uh, bacterial infections, they could be sneezing, they could have eye discharge, nasal discharge, their nose nostrils could be plugged up. Um, they could potentially have problems like uh, respiratory distress where they're bobbing their tails. Um, and that's something that people often hear about or read about or even experience um, where their bird is, they look at it sitting on its perch and they see the tail kind of pumping. And if they were resting and not recently flying or doing any real uh, rigorous activity to where maybe they would be a little bit breathing a little heavier, they were just resting. They should not have their tail pumping up and down. That's definitely an indication that birds working too hard to breathe. Um, if these things progress to be deeper in the respiratory tract, not just in, up in the sinuses, um, then you can have the lungs be affected. They may be um, really opening their beak to breathe um, and having real respiratory distress. Um, so if we have a bird that we are seeing these sort of symptoms in, and we want to know whether or not it has a bacterial infection causing its signs and symptoms, then we need to do some diagnostics to figure that out. Because the unfortunate reality is all those signs that I mentioned, sneezing, ocular discharge, nasal discharge, open beak breathing, bump, uh, pumping its tail, um, all of those things, they're nonspecific. It doesn't mean that there's a bacterial infection if you see that. You can see that from all the other types of problems we're going to talk about today, viruses, fungal organisms, inflammatory conditions. I mean, there's so many, so many of these things just really look very, very similar. And so we often have to do some diagnostics to figure out which one of these problems it is so that we know how to treat it most appropriately. So we may be doing things like radiographs. And I put this picture of an x-ray up because I wanted to show you, this is actually um, a bird that's having pretty significant pathology in its respiratory system. Now, if you remember, I'm going to go back to this one. Notice on this x-ray, again, the lungs are sort of plastered here along the back, but then the air sacs branch off in lungs and see how much black we see in the back part of this bird's abdomen. That's all that gas that's in the air sacs. Now look at this x-ray and now look at this x-ray. And you should be able to tell that there is an immediate difference. Over here, I can see that black where I should be seeing air sacs, but I don't see that on this side. Why is it? Why is it so bright white? You can tell that there is obviously a difference from uh, the right side, which is more normal to the left side, which is very abnormal. 
that's because those air sacs are getting infiltrated with something. And so that's where we worry about, again, is there a bacterial infection in there, a fungal infection in there, or did they aspirate? Did they potentially like inhale fluid and it went down into one side um, in, the, in the air sacs? Um, this, is, this is definitely evidence of significant disease. You can imagine um, that this bird is not going to be breathing very well. All those air sacs are really impaired. We're really only breathing um, and having good airflow through the air sacs on this side. Now, again, gas exchange occurs through the lungs. So, but look at, look at how more hazy it is over here compared to this side. This is not the most perfect x-ray in the world, but it does, you can tell, look much more fuzzy here than over here. And so that's just an indication that, yeah, this bird has um, problems for sure in its respiratory system. So x-rays can be one of our first most important diagnostics, because if I see something like this, oh man, this bird is sick, we need to be doing a lot more with it. Um, but I can do cultures, so I can take samples to um, culture different portions of the respiratory tract. Um, I can swab like the sinuses or the trachea. And if I do an endoscopy procedure where I have the bird under anesthesia and actually put a little scope into the side and look in those air sacs, I could potentially take cultures from that area as well. But cultures allow me to grow bacteria or fungus that could potentially be present in those sites. And then we can know specifically what organism is here from bacterial or fungal organisms. And what sort of medications are going to be the most appropriate to treat it with. Now, blood work may also need to be done. And the reason I say blood work is because um, sometimes, you know, I may not really want to necessarily put this bird under anesthesia, do an endoscopy just yet and, and grab a culture. I may want to do something that's less invasive because it is invasive to have to put a bird under anesthesia and do an endoscopy. Now it's a minimally invasive procedure, but it's still a little invasive. And if that bird is not in the best health state, I need to make the most appropriate decision for that bird and say, Hey, in a perfect world, I'd love to do this particular endoscopy, but your bird's not going to be stable for this. We need to try to do less invasive things first, try to get an answer that way, try to stabilize the bird. And maybe we reserve the, the um, endoscopy stuff for later based on what our tests are determining and also our response to treatment. Um, but blood work, I can do a CDC that allows me to look at their white blood cells to look for evidence of um, an, a high white cell count that could be indicative of an infection. Uh, I can also do blood testing that tests for antibodies to certain infectious diseases. Um, and then I put PCR testing as well, because for chlamydia in particular, that doesn't culture very well. So often we want to swab them to see if we can isolate the DNA of that chlamydia organism. Of all these diagnostics, as I mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, I've already had two patients today that came in for respiratory problems. Um, and I will tell you that today already, I did a PCR test for chlamydia to test for that in one individual. And in a different individual, I did a CBC to look at their white cell count. Um, both of them were presenting slightly differently uh, with their respiratory signs, um, some a little more minor. So I wasn't too uh, severely worried to where I want, you know, x-rays and more involved stuff. Um, but I did want, you know, a couple of different basic diagnostics to help me know what do we need to do for this bird. Now, depending upon what we find with our diagnostics, then we need to get them on appropriate treatments. But uh, the treatments that we often use for bacterial infections are going to be antibiotics, you know, and, and there's a lot of different antibiotics that are out there. So, um, you know, if your veterinarian says, hey, I'd like to do this particular antibiotic, if you haven't heard of, of that particular antibiotic, it's not necessarily a bad thing. There's lots of different antibiotics that are out there. And sometimes people have heard very commonly about a particular antibiotic called enrofloxacin. Um, that is the drug name, but the sort of um, brand name is Batril. A lot of people have heard about Batril. And Batril is a good antibiotic that is used for a lot of respiratory problems, but it's not the only one out there. Sometimes people will say, oh my God, I want my bird on Batril because I know that is appropriate for respiratory problems. It's appropriate for a lot of them, but it's not appropriate for all respiratory problems. Um, we may be using Dr cyclin or azithromycin or clavamox. I mean, there's tons of different antibiotics out there. So it's something that there is not one perfect antibiotic. Um, you know, you, you want to uh, trust your veterinarian, talk with them about why we were using this particular one uh, that a bird may be going on to, to help the bird. And, and really, if you have a culture to say that um, what organism is present, the cultures also tell you which antibiotics are most effective for that organism that that animal has. And so we often will base antibiotics off of cultures if we have that particular diagnostic. 
The other thing is anti-inflammatories can be really helpful too. Anti-inflammatories uh, are going to be things like meloxicam is the most common one. Uh, we use it for a variety of different things. But when you have these respiratory problems, it's not uncommon for there to be some inflammation going on. And sometimes the inflammation is a contributing uh, factor to the bird not feeling well. So sometimes you need to do a combination of, of those medications. And then I also put nebulization because nebulization is where a bird sits in a nebulizing chamber and um, antibiotics or just moisturized air uh, gets uh, pumped into that little chamber and it helps them. If it's just moisturized air, moisturized air can be great. It can help with, uh, clearing secretions from the respiratory tract, making them sneeze easier. Um, but if we have it be a medicated nebulization, they could be nebulized with antibiotics or antifungals again, depending upon what the problem is. Um, to, to get them the treatment that they need. And the nice thing about nebulization is, okay, our antibiotics that we're giving systemically are working sort of from the blood and getting to where they need to be. But the nebulizations are working topically. So they're getting onto the respiratory surfaces and working on that topical surface to help reduce bacterial numbers or clear up secretions, that sort of stuff. Okay, the next infectious disease that I wanted to talk about was aspergillosis, because a lot of, or fungal, I should say. I'll start off with fungal, because uh, aspergillosis is the most common fungal organism that people will find, but there's other fungal organisms too. It's not just aspergillosis that's out there. There have been uh, papers that have shown that we used to think, oh, uh, fungal disease in birds causing respiratory problems, aspergillosis, that's the only thing. It's not the case. Uh, there's other things that are out there. Um, so, but aspergillosis, despite that, still is the most common one. And when we have a bird where we're suspicious of aspergillosis, and that x ray that I just showed you guys, I don't know if that is bacterial or fungal or, or even potentially viral. You know, it could be any of those particular things. Um, I need to do the diagnostics to determine what it could be. And with aspergillosis in particular, as I mentioned in, in the previous slide, that radiographs are helpful, blood work is helpful. Well, there is aspergillus panels that can be done that look at antibodies and antigens specific for aspergillus um, that could tell us if they have that particular infectious disease causing their problems. Um, as I mentioned, endoscopy on the last, uh, the last slide, um, it absolutely is very, very helpful for a lot of these aspergillus patients. It allows us to kind of get an idea of how involved things are, what is the prognosis for this bird, how long is it potentially going to be on treatments, um, but we do have to reserve those endoscopies for those patients that are more stable. I absolutely have taken birds to do endoscopies when they look like what they look like on that last x-ray. Um, don't get me wrong, it is absolutely done, but that those birds that are going in for it, they're at a more stable state to where we say, okay, we think this bird's gonna be okay with the anesthesia and everything involved. There's always a risk with anesthesia. I can never tell you that there is no risk. Um, it's just a reality of anesthesia, but we need to get them to the most stable state to allow us to be able to do those procedures so that we can get the best answer for what's going on. Because sometimes you also have birds that have two problems. They have an aspergillosis problem, but then they get a secondary fungal or a secondary bacterial infection on top of it. And so it's like, you know, you need multi, multi, multiple therapies. Now, when we're treating fungal infections, rather than using antibacterials, we are using antifungals. There's a variety of different antifungals that are out there. There's not as many antifungals as there are um, antibacterials. Uh, so we have a little more narrow window of things that we're using to treat with, but those are going to be things like uh, itraconazole. Um, now, African greys can have an odd reaction to itraconazole, so it's not too common for them to be put on itraconazole, but there's another medication called voriconazole, um, and African greys tend to be put on that. Certain species may be more sensitive to voriconazole, so um, it's kind of variable, uh, but there's, there's also nebulizations that we can do for them with things like amphoteris and B or trimazole. So there's a few different things out there that we can do to treat these guys. Now, the, the big thing to know about the difference between bacterial um, respiratory infections and fungal respiratory infections is fungal respiratory infections take a lot longer to heal. And so they're usually like with a bacterial infection, depending upon how severe it is, how much involvement there is. You may be looking at just 10 days, 14 days of treatments up to potentially if it was a really bad 
uh, infection, you may be looking at about a month. With, with fungal infections, it's at least a month, like minimum. Like you are lucky if that bird is able to come off of antifungals at a month. Um, usually we're talking about a couple of months and there's some birds that are on antifungals for like six months or longer. Um, there is a potential for side effects from antifungals. So we have to be uh, monitoring these birds while they're on these medications to make sure that they're doing okay with them. Um, and not having side effects. Because if they are, well, then we need to change our game plan and how we're treating them. Um, this little picture here, these two pictures I have, they're the same bird. Um, this is a little green cheek conure, and I put him up because he did have an aspergillus infection. And, and the reason I put him up is because a lot of people I find think that it's more the bigger birds that get aspergillosis and little ones don't get as much. And it's true that in that, you know, there is the bigger parrots seem to have a little more propensity, medium to bigger sized parrots have a little more propensity, it seems like to come in with aspergillosis, but the little guys absolutely can have it as well. This little guy presented to us um, in pretty acute respiratory distress. He was opening his beak to breathe. He was pretty severe and he had to have an air sac tube placed. So this teeny little thing that you can see right here off the side, um, that is actually a tube that is going into his air sacs and it's allowing him to breathe comfortably um, because he had an aspergillus infection that was affecting his um, trachea so that he didn't have as good of like the trachea was more narrowed than what it should be because of fungal plaque and also because of um, uh, mucus that was in the trachea from just all the irritation um, and inflammation and everything. And so because it was almost causing an obstruction, this little guy was almost not able to breathe. We had to place this air sac tube in. And as soon as we put that air sac tube in, he was able to breathe fine. Because as you remember from the whole physiology part of this lecture at the beginning, we talked about how air moves down that trachea, goes through the lungs, but bypasses and goes into the air sacs in the back first. And then as they exhale, that air from the back goes back into the lungs and that's when gas exchange occurs. Well, where that this air sac tube is placed, it's in those back air sac tubes. So he's getting oxygen right back into those air sac tubes and then it's able to still go through its normal respiratory cycle up to those lungs and have the normal gas exchange. So, so this little bird was breathing better out of his side than actually out of his trachea like normal. The tube did have to be replaced. So in this picture, you can kind of see there's a little bit of tape that's like holding it in. It's over on this side, but it's really quite hidden. Um, and what's really interesting about these tubes is most of the time, birds recognize that these tubes are helping them and leave them alone. Because at first, you have to put the bird under anesthesia to place this air sac tube. And at first, when you do it, they may wake up from anesthesia and they're like, what is that? You know, and they may turn around and try to bite it. But as soon as they bite it and they recognize, oh my God, I can't breathe, they stop. And they learn very quickly that I'm going to leave that alone because I can breathe now. So it, it's quite amazing. They learn very fast that they shouldn't touch that. Um, so you usually don't have to put any like cones on them. I mean, occasionally you do, but for the most part, most of them, you don't have to put any sort of cone that prevents them from getting to it because they just, they get it. There's that, that bird brain that's super smart. Dr. Uh, Lamb, can they, can they fly with that? Like, can they, they could, yeah. They could, because it's just, it's underneath the wing um, and it's, it's not affecting the flight at all. So now they may not want to, because if they're so bad, like so sick that they have to have an air sac tube, they're probably not feeling well enough to actually fly. Um, but I'm sure if they were, you know, nervous or startled, then they, you know, instincts kick in and you may just take off for a moment, but they probably wouldn't want to have any sustained flight. I can't think of any that I've had that have had their air sac tube in that have that have wanted to do sustained flight because we only keep these in for a certain period of time. So we're usually keeping these in, them in until that trachea is cleared. And then we're able to pull them, they're breathing normally from their trachea, but they're still on medications because if we're dealing with this aspergillus infection, it's usually, again, several months that they're on, on therapy. So these are really meant to be in there just more as like rescue therapy, just in the beginning. And not every single bird that has aspergillosis needs this you know, it's only those that end up having obstruction of the trachea. Um, now they can have obstruction from the trachea from other reasons and not just aspergillosis is going to require these air sac tubes to be placed. Um, they could have something else that's in there. I, I've had birds that have, you know, inhaled a seed or I had one bird that got bit by another bird on the neck, which is a very kind of weird thing. Most birds, when they get into fights, they bite beaks or toes, um, but it had crushed the trachea and actually had compress the trachea. So rather than be a nice open tube, it was like compressed down. That was a very weird one, but, um, you know, that one needed an air sac tube. So 
Okay, other infectious diseases, there's viral and parasitic. I didn't put as much information about these on here because the good news is when it comes to our pet parrots, we don't see as many viral things. Now, influenza I put up there because, you know, avian influenza is a problem. There's many different types of influenza. And right now in the US, there is a problem with avian influenza and particularly a high pathogenic influenza. And there have been some parrots that um, have, um, have gotten it and have passed. Um, Thankfully, not so much because they have to have contact with wild birds, but if your birds are outside, then there is a risk. Um, so just something to be aware of. Uh, herpes, I put up there as well because every once in a while we'll see a herpes patient, um, but it, that's uh, causing respiratory problems. It's not as common as it used to be. Like when birds were still being imported into the U.S., um, it was a bigger problem. Now, you know, I, my focus is very much U.S. centric because that's where I live and work, but I know we, you know, people watch these all over the world. And so there may be other parts of the world where people see this in parrots more than I get to see it because of just different ways of managing birds. Um, so uh, important to know about, but in the US we don't see it a ton. And then I did also put for parasites, the air sac mites, and I put a picture of zebra finch on here because air sac mites are not a big problem in our parrots in any way. It's really more our little passerines. And a lot of people who watch these webinars, you know, they have pet birds, right? And so a lot of people not only have parrots, but they also may have some finches or canaries. And finches and canaries are going to be the ones that are more likely to have a problem from air sac mites. And so if I have a finch or a canary that comes in with respiratory distress, um, I this is something I need to think about is air sac mites. And sometimes you'll get lucky and you can actually uh, part the feathers along the neck so that you can actually see the trachea because their skin is very, very, very thin. And if you shine a bright light up against the skin, it kind of illuminates the trachea and you can sometimes see mites actually crawling up and down the trachea, poor little bird. Um, and so if we see that, like definitely that bird is getting on some anti-mite medication, but sometimes they need antibiotics too, because sometimes they have a secondary bacterial infection. So sometimes again, it goes back to, you need multimodal therapy. Okay, so that's our infectious diseases that I wanted to, to talk about. Um, but we do also have inflammatory diseases. Now, as I mentioned, infectious disease can cause a lot of inflammation and that inflammation can contribute to respiratory signs and symptoms. But sometimes we have just primary inflammatory disease that leads to respiratory signs. And there isn't an infection as a component of it, or sometimes there is, but it's as the inflammation is the primary problem and the infection happened just because it became an opportunistic infection because there was all this inflammation which created a great environment for bacteria to attach to and overgrow. So sometimes they still work together, but there are cases where you have birds that present with respiratory distress and it's not because of an infection. It's not because of some sort of organ problem compressing the air sacs. It's because of inflammation alone. And in particular, there is a problem called, um, it goes by a few different names. So avian pulmonary hypersensitivity syndrome. It's a long sort of name, uh, but that's the sort of more, I guess, uh, main way that people are calling it right now in, in the veterinary world. It could change, people may come up with a better name. Um, but the name that is sort of more heard as an easier thing to say is avian asthma. Some people just don't like that term because it's a little different. The, the like um, pulmonary anatomy is different from a mammal. And when we think of um, asthma, we're thinking oftentimes more of mammals. Um, so the pulmonary anatomy is a little different, but it's still quite similar in the physiology of what's happening. Uh, inflammation is occurring uh, in those pulmonary, like in the pulmonary tissue itself where gas exchange is occurring. And that inflammation can sometimes lead to smooth muscle that's in the lungs, the little smooth muscle that's in there to like cause constriction and sort of narrowing of the airways. And then if you're narrowing those airways, you're not getting as good of oxygenation to those airways. 
Um, but then that inflammation that is in those airways may make it so that that gas exchange isn't happening to the degree that it's supposed to. Because the way that gas exchange occurs is gas is traveling across a membrane, a couple of membranes to get into the blood and then into loaded into a red blood cell um, and then travels throughout the body with that red blood cell. And if there's like a thick layer of inflammation and mucus and that sort of stuff, um, it's harder for that oxygen to sort of pass through those membranes. And so if you're not getting enough oxygen, then you start to have respiratory distress, you know, because, oh my gosh, your brain recognizes I'm not getting enough oxygen. I need more. So you start breathing heavier. Um, and the main bird that actually comes in with this particular problem is the blue and gold macaw. Now it is, you can see it in other birds too. And I have, um, seen it in non-blue and gold macaws, other types of macaws. And I've even seen it in a couple of cockatiels as well. Um, so it's just that the blue and gold macaw is sort of like the poster child for this particular problem. Um, and I'm not too sure that we, well, we don't have the answer for it. I'm not too sure why that blue and gold macaw is. There certainly needs to be more research to sort of understand why they are the ones that are the poster children for it. Um, and we, we still need more research to truly understand what's happening with pulmonary hypersensitivity syndrome or avian asthma. But what we do know is there's inflammation and something has triggered that inflammation. Now in people and animals that have asthma, you know, there's also something triggering that inflammation. So something, some antigen is stimulating the body and making them have this inflammatory process. And the same thing is, is happening in birds. Um, there is a lot of thought that blue and gold macaws or other macaws, um, they shouldn't be housed with powder down species. And so powder down species are going to be like African grays, um, and cockatoos, where they produce more of that powdery down the down feather that sort of flakes off pieces of it. And then you have this more dusty environment. And so for some reason, when these macaws and, and other birds that may be sensitive are around these powder down species, um, it could be something that ignites this inflammatory process. But I don't know that we totally have it figured out yet, because although that's something that a lot of people say, I've known plenty of people who have had a mix of aviaries where they have blue and gold macaw with a powder down species for years and never have and never have problems. You know, these birds have been together for like 30 years. Um, so it may be more a function of maybe the environment isn't getting that dust out of it so much. So yes, maybe the, the powder down species are part of the problem because they produce all this dust, but then it may be that the environment isn't getting that dust taken away and the dust is building up and that's what ignites that inflammatory response. Because I absolutely have this happen in patients who don't, who are not around powder down species. Um, so there's still something about it that we don't totally understand. Uh, but I do know of patients that I've had, or some of my patients I've had it happen in, have had it happen um, in environments that seem to be totally perfectly normal, you know, like they don't, they're not living around dusty birds. They, and the owners don't have other pets that could be making things dusty. The owners report that they're cleaning pretty normally um, and thoroughly. And so sometimes we don't know what it is, but there's something in the environment that's igniting this. Um, when a bird comes in, in respiratory distress, because that's how these guys usually present initially is they are coming in, it's an emergency situation, they are gasping to breathe, they are tail bobbing, they're open beak breathing. Um, it can be quite scary. When they come in, we put them right into oxygen and let them sit and relax. And sometimes we even give them sedatives when they go into oxygen because they get themselves so worked up that as they're worked up, it's just making the problem worse and they're breathing heavier because they're worked up. And so we need to sedate them a little bit to make them breathe a little bit easier. Um, and then we're gonna start doing things like blood work where we're looking for, is there an inflammatory uh, change to the white cells? and usually with these cases, there isn't a change with the white cells. If we see a change with the white cells, we're more concerned about infection. So these cases, I don't have a high white cell count um, unless I have a secondary infection on top of it. So, so again, sometimes things complicate themselves. Um, X-rays may show a little bit more dense appearance to the lungs. The real way to diagnose this is you have to do an endoscopy and get a biopsy of the lungs. So these are these cases where like, maybe we're doing these tests and, and we're not getting our answers. And we go, gosh, obviously there's something still wrong with this bird, but all of its infectious diseases testing is coming up normal. We put it on antibiotics or antifungals. It's not getting better. Um, you know, do an endoscopy and then we can get our answers. But a lot of times um, I, I will admit, I don't always get a definitive diagnosis because 
Some of these says these birds are just coming in in such respiratory distress. Do I really want to put them under anesthesia? Probably not. I want to sedate them so they feel more comfortable with breathing, but I may not want to be putting them under anesthesia just yet. And so sometimes it's okay. We do all the tests. We don't find anything as far as infectious disease goes. Let's put them on things like anti-inflammatories to take the inflammation away. Cause that's the primary problem is there's inflammation going on, but also bronchodilators. So things that remember how I said initially, you have this smooth muscle that's in the lungs and it contracts and it narrows that airway. Well, we can give them medications that make that smooth muscle relax and open that airway up a little bit better so more oxygenation happens. If I give a bird a bronchodilator and an anti-inflammatory and nothing else and it responds and it's breathing fine, this bird probably has pulmonary hypersensitivity syndrome. And then I need to question the owners, well, what's the environment like? Are they around a powder down species? Do you have a... Um, air purifier. Air purifiers are great for these particular birds because we're getting stuff out of the environment. Um, also humidifiers are great because humidifiers allow for little fine particles of, of um, you know, moisture to be in the air and kind of that can trap stuff and allow it to drop down um, from being suspended in the air. Um, so these birds often need to be managed on making sure they have a really clean environment, like that's number one, but then also anti-inflammatories. Some of them have to be on anti-inflammatories long-term, some don't. I try to get them off of anti-inflammatories if I can, because, you know, it's better to not be on any medications. We want our, we want animals to be off of medications if we possibly can, but some of these birds need to stay on anti-inflammatories. There are absolutely some birds out there that I have as patients that if they are not on their anti-inflammatories, they are going to be in, in the office pretty soon with some respiratory distress um, and being in oxygen. We obviously don't want that. Um, so as far as the bronchodilators, usually those are things that we're just using in the event of the actual asthma attack itself. And if you think about like uh, people who have asthma, you know, there's inhalers that are, you are using for your actual asthma attack, your rescue inhalers. And then there may be certain inhalers that you're taking that are more maintenance therapy. And so you want to think about kind of that in these birds that have this problem where, okay, the bronchodilators are being used as a rescue therapy when the actual attack is happening, but the anti-inflammatories are being used more as that sort of maintenance thing. But if we can get them off the maintenance, that would be the most ideal thing. So Right now, to get outside of the actual respiratory system and talk about a couple of other problems that can cause respiratory signs, because again, those respiratory signs of open beak breathing, tail bobbing, you know, uh, just respiratory distress, it, can't, it doesn't always have to be associated with actual respiratory problems. It can be the respiratory system is affected secondarily. And the first one I want to talk about is cardiac disease, which we have talked about before in previous webinars. So if anybody wants to know more about cardiac disease, they can go back to some previous webinars and rewatch those. Um, but the cardiovascular system is really important to transport that oxygen around the body, right? So the lungs is where you have that oxygen coming in, but then the cardiovascular system is picking up that oxygen in the bloods, delivering it out through the veins to the different tissues. Um, so if the cardiovascular system is not working well, because it's not pumping blood flow around appropriately, um, then what happens is well, you may not get as good of oxygen flow to tissues because you, you know that, that cardiovascular system is what's having the red blood cell that's carrying that oxygen around the body. So if you don't have good blood flow, oxygen isn't getting delivered to tissues the way that it should. The other problem with cardiovascular disease is if you're not pumping blood appropriately and there's different physiologic things that can happen, you can't actually have fluid leak from vessels. And if fluid leaks from vessels, then you can get what is called ascites, if fluid leaks and gets into like the uh, salomic cavity, or you can get uh, fluid in the lungs themselves. Um, and that both those lead to increased breathing effort. And if you look at this, these pictures that I have here, again, we're looking at x-rays. And if you go back to looking at that first x-ray that we had that was sort of our normal x-rays you can see we don't have as good of um air sac space in this bird either we've got these weird like brighter spots um and this bird the back part of its abdomen it's got really poor air sac detail it also just happens to have an egg so that's kind of like a, a thing that is was an other incidental problem this bird had multiple issues and when i look at it from this view i really have no air sac space in the back part of this bird's abdomen um 
this bird had cardiovascular disease. This bird had atherosclerosis and it had gone into secondary congestive heart failure and it had fluid that was building up um, in its abdomen. It didn't have fluid building up in its lungs. This one was uh, not having left-sided congestive heart failure, it was having right-sided congestive heart failure, um, but there was a lot of fluid in there. And we put it on medications that helped to draw that fluid off. Um, because with all that fluid in that belly, it's compressing those air sacs. You're not even getting as good of oxygen sort of flow through that whole respiratory system. And so this bird had respiratory distress because it couldn't expand those air sacs to the degree that it could or should. Um, and also probably had some respiratory distress because again, that poor oxygen delivery, it didn't have as good a blood flow to different parts of the body. It results in reduced oxygen level uh, to the tissues who makes it so that the cells in those tissues don't have the oxygen they need to function well, which then sends a signal back to, you know, your brain that's, hey, I can't breathe well, so they have increased respiratory effort. So cardiac disease can secondarily affect your respiratory system. The other thing is silomic disease. So birds have a silomic cavity. A lot of people are like, what is that? It's just, um, when we think about mammals, we have our thoracic cavity and our abdominal cavity, and they're kind of separated by a diaphragm. Birds don't have a diaphragm. So um, they have just the whole salomic cavity. It's a combination of like thoracic and abdominal cavity. Um, and so because they don't have that separation and those lungs are plastered to the back of the lungs and they have those air sacs that branch off of those lungs, if there is something in that salomic cavity that is enlarged in some way and causes compression on those air sacs, then they might not have as good of air circulation and thus have respiratory distress. And there's a variety of things that can lead to compression of those air sacs. Number one is that uh, fluid and that's ascites. And so I already talked about heart disease on the previous slide for ascites. But interestingly, when birds have ascites, more often than not, it's from reproductive tract problems. Um, yes, we see it with heart disease, absolutely. And we can also see it with liver problems too, can cause ascites or that fluid buildup in the abdomen. But by and far, when a bird comes in and has this big rounded belly, it's in respiratory distress, I have to feel its abdomen. If its abdomen feels big and the bird's in respiratory distress, the first thing I have to think about is this bird probably has fluid on its abdomen. And then I wanna find out if it does, I can put an ultrasound probe, look and see if oh, there's fluid in there. Okay, now I can drain this fluid out. And when you drain that fluid out, it's pretty awesome because sometimes these birds come in and they're just so, so much in respiratory respiratory distress. Um, that belly feels big. I go, oh my gosh, there's fluid in here. Let's take fluid out. And then you take the fluid off and they're like, hey, I'm good. I can breathe. <laughs> and they feel a whole lot better. But then we have to figure out why they have that fluid. And like 90% of the time, if, if not more, it's because of reproductive tract pathology. There's so many things that happen associated with the reproductive tract not functioning the way that it's supposed to. And we have talked about those at various times with our other uh, reproductive lectures and hormone lectures. Um, but certain reproductive problems can lead to fluid buildup on that belly. Again, that fluid buildup puts pressure on the air sacs, impairs flow of oxygen, and, and you have your signs. The other thing is organ enlargement. Sometimes you have a bird that comes in here with one of its organs being enlarged, and that unfortunately a lot of times can be from things like cancer, but can also be from infection. Um, I've had birds come in that have had certain infections that cause their liver to be rather large, and that caused a little bit of compression on the air sacs, and they may have mild respiratory distress if it's just um, like a, a little bit of um, liver enlargement. But if it's something like cancer that's involving more of the abdomen and compressing those air sacs, then they can be a, a big uh, amount of respiratory distress. Um, and then I put normal physiology as well could potentially cause a little bit of respiratory distress. And when would normal physiology cause respiratory distress? When we're egg laying. Um, and this picture down here shows a bird that's uh, in normal, um, it, it is a bird that is having normal uh, respiratory or reproductive tract functioning and that is produced an egg. Um, and that egg is sitting in that abdomen. Um, but again, when you look at the rest of this bird's x-ray, like everything is just as white out. I don't see the normal air sac space that I'm supposed to see right here because the lung is right here. I should have air sac space right here. Instead, I see all this white stuff. The reproductive tract, when it is not active, is very, very, very tiny. When it becomes active, it gets quite large. It takes up more space. And then if you have an egg that's developing inside of it, and if that egg decides to stay in the abdomen too, and they're having any sort of egg binding, then that giant reproductive tract and that egg sitting there, again, puts pressure on those air sacs. And so they may present with a little bit of respiratory distress when they're just having normal egg laying. Um, so 
there certainly are other things that can cause respiratory distress in birds aside from just infections and inflammatory problems directly affecting the lungs and air sacs. So I think that's all that I have. Oh, sorry, one more slide before we get to the questions. Sorry. So what should you do if your bird is showing signs of respiratory distress? You really should take them to the vet as soon as possible. I mean, respiratory distress is not something you want to mess with because if you have a bird that has asthma or if you have a bird that has some really bad infection, you have got to get them to the vet um, quickly. Because like that one bird that that had the um, obstruction in the trachea and we had to put an air sac to him, the obstruction in the trachea from aspergillus, if they would have waited longer, it could have gotten worse. It could have totally obstructed and he could have not been able to breathe. And if a bird can't breathe, it's only going to take a second and they're going to die. Um, so you have to, you really have to get them to the vet when you have respiratory distress. When you're at the vet, do expect that the vet is going to want to do some testing. Testing helps the veterinarian figure out what is going on. And because as we talked about, there's so many different things that could potentially be making them have respiratory distress. These are just some of the things that vet may say needs to be done. And, and you don't, you know, going to the vet, you're not probably going to have to do every single thing on this list. I'm not saying that that's going to happen, but these are things that you might hear. Your vet may want to do blood work. They may want to do some sort of imaging studies. They may want to test for specific infectious diseases. They may be talking about cultures, biopsies, endoscopies. They may be talking about a variety of different things with you. And it's all in the effort to try to figure out what is going on specifically with this bird so we can get this bird the treatments that it needs to have the best chance of healing. Okay, so I'm going to stop my share screen uh, because I am done with my slideshow here. Um, so uh, what questions can I answer for you guys? Okay, well, first of all, that was a bunch of great information that you shared with us. So um, that was definitely a, an impeccably um, uh, robust walkthrough of everything that can affect your bird's breathing. So thank you. <laughs> that was that was pretty spectacular. Um, so we do have. A, I'm gonna throw out. We we had we have a bit of questions, but uh, we'll get we'll get to them as we'll kind of on the, our time wise. Okay. Here's one for you. Can birds um, ex expectorate accumulation of materials from their respiratory system? Do birds cough? So they want to know. Could my cockatoo be doing something uh, that looks like a sneeze to clear her trachea, or can I assume it is? It looks like a sneeze, and it is more up in her sinus or her nair or the nair. That, that's a great question. So you know, when we think about classical coughing, like for us, there, like our diaphragm is helping, like kind of like expel things out. And so birds are a little different because they don't have that diaphragm, but they definitely do a behavior where yes, they can expectorate, they can bring things up. Uh, but interestingly with them when they do it, so they'll often do some sort of like head jerking motion. And then they often like fling their head around to kind of get stuff out more because they don't have as much of a, an ability to actually cough the way that we can, but they have some ability. It's just slightly, slightly different. So as far as whether you can see that and tell that it's upper airway versus lower airway, you know, I'll, I will say that majority of the time it's going to be more likely to be upper airway because they have so much sinuses and there's so much like stuff that can happen in those upper sinuses. And I realized I didn't talk about the sinuses so much. Um, so most of the time it's going to be more like in the sinuses than when they're trying to like expel something out. Um, because you have kind of birds that have really severe lung pathology or air sac pathology. None of that stuff is coming up and they're not doing any sort of coughing. They're just having respiratory distress. But if there's something in the trachea that's irritating and they're trying to expel that, then then yes, it may be lower down, but that's trachea is still considered like upper airway disease. It's not considered lower airway disease until you get to lungs and air sacs. Okay. And then let's see if we can squeeze in uh, another question for you. Um, doo -doo. Let's see. Oh yeah. I just, that, that was fascinating. The little tube on the, uh, the underwing there and the, the little tube that <laughs> <laughs> that little car in your picture was that was yeah it, it, it's very discreet it's like it's kind of like um exactly and he, he did great with it you know and a lot of times I think people think of those little birds as like man you can't really do too much with them if it's a little bird it's respiratory distress it's a goner not the case you know we can do things we have to be more delicate absolutely um yeah. but you know we certainly can do stuff to help those little guys and I imagine like if they had a cage mate maybe separate them because they might the bird itself might not fiddle with it but maybe like you know, like someone else would like their preening partner. <laughs> Just think about that because, well, you know, yeah. Like a different uh, okay. So here we go. Here's the next question. Uh, how does a parent get aspergillosis? Um, they're okay. yellow uh, YNA, yellow 
uh, I guess, has enlarged air sacs. His vet always does the panel and the CBC, et cetera. He's not displaying any uh, symptomatology. Could he be allowed, uh, followed closely because of his air sacs? Does a bird having aspergillosis in the early years typically lead to lung problems in later life? Okay, so how there sounds like a lot of questions in there. So first off, uh, how do birds get aspergillus? So aspergillus is a fungal organism that is ubiquitous, which means that it is everywhere in the environment on land. Interestingly, out in the sea, like it's not a problem out there. So penguins, really interestingly, are really prone to aspergillosis because when they or penguins in um, like zoo settings are more prone to aspergillosis because they're coming from like a you know, their totally native environment of this aquatic environment and then being here in on land where there's aspergillus everywhere. And so in their aquatic environment, they're like never exposed to it, but in their like land environment, like it's, it can be overwhelming. So they're actually really prone to it. Um, so it is, it is honestly everywhere. Uh, so when a bird gets it, it's kind of sometimes luck of the draw. Um, now, if they are in a dirty environment, or I don't want to say necessarily a dirty environment, but if they have an environment where they don't have as much airflow, then there is the potential for there to be more buildup of aspergillus spores to where they could get it. Um, so yes, everywhere in the environment. And then the, you know, the last question of all of that was, um, if they have aspergillus when they're younger, are they prone to it, like prone to um, uh, problems, respiratory problems later in life? It's possible. It depends on how much damage was done to lung tissue. Um, so potentially, hopefully not. Hopefully not. One of the things is that when a bird does have aspergillosis, you do have to follow them out for a while, even when they've stopped medications, because sometimes aspergillus does come back. Sometimes you think you have gotten everything, all your tests are looking great and have been looking great for a while, and you stop the medications and then it slowly creeps back. So it is something that you do usually have to have your veterinarian follow them out for a period of time. Um, I think there was one, at least one other portion to that question but i might have missed something oh sorry um might have been let's see um well about them have if they get it uh in the early years will they have lung problems later um oh i guess uh could he be followed closely because of his air sacs oh because he said that his air sacs looks a little funny on x-rays, you know, enlarged. Yeah. A little enlarged. Okay. So, I mean, the, again, there's a variety of different things that can be going on. So it, it's good that they did the tests for aspergillosis. If, they, if that bird has had multiple tests of the like blood panels and other things, and it hasn't shown up as having aspergillosis um, on multiple different tests, if his white cell counts are okay, then it's probably okay. It probably doesn't have aspergillosis, but they may be following that because they want to, you know, there's something odd on the x-rays that they need to be monitoring. And so I'd have to see the x-rays to see what it was that they were looking at to know better of like, how much do we need to be monitoring this? Is this something that, um, you know, requires more long-term evaluation? Okay. Okay. And uh, just so I got a couple, I got announced today's winner of our giveaway. Um, that is uh, Teresa Sala. Congratulations. You're going to be sent a uh, foraging pack and another product, a uh, Lefebvre product of your choice. And um, just, we had, we had, we actually had a, a really good turnout and a lot of questions for today. So, so that just shows you how much uh, of a draw you are, Dr. Lamb, <laughs> with our audience. Uh, <laughs> a lot of thank yous. And if we didn't get to your, um, your question today, um, uh, we will, let's see, uh, you'll get an email with your, your question um, and an answer. So um, uh, yeah, so just uh, be patient. We got a lot of questions to, to get back, at, uh, a lot of answers to get back to a lot of questions. So um, there we go. And uh, yeah, a lot of Thank you very much. Outstanding presentation. Well, I think you guys are welcome. <laughs> way more than they ever imagined they could possibly learn about, <laughs> about <laughs> the bird's respiratory system. So they, I, I, there's just, I didn't know, I mean, there's just, there's so many things going on there. So <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. No problem. All right. So um, on that note, oh my goodness, it's, uh, wow, it's, 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 the, it's already, we're already diving into December. So I hope everyone's having a, um, a great lead into the holiday season. Uh, we will be having that holiday webinar. So um, mark your calendars, check your emails, check our, our send outs for that. Uh, our, our holiday giveaway webinar will be coming up very soon. Um, all right. On that note, I want to wish everyone a very, very, very happy holiday weekend as we dive into the shopping season, I'm sure. And always shop with your bird in mind, which means don't buy uh, coated 
what BFTA coded items or, yep. or other hazards. But um, all right. I'll meet all right. Oh, okay. On that note, Bye. everyone have a great weekend. All the best in your flock and everyone stay safe. And Dr. Lamb, once again, thank you so much for another awesome presentation. You're welcome. Bye.